Extreme poverty, the loss of fertile lands, and lack of access to traditional foods have caused many Native Americans to suffer from diet-related problems, including food insecurity, obesity, and diabetes, in stunning numbers. Nearly 16% of Native Americans, for example, live with type 2 diabetes, more than double the percentage of Caucasians. These are but some of the challenges that occupy our guest, Attorney Colby Duran. I am Kelly Brownell, Director of the World Food Policy Center at Duke University and Professor of Public Policy at Duke. Colby Duran is Director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas Office of Economic Development. He specializes in federal Indian law and policy with a specific focus on food, agriculture, nutrition, natural resources, and economic development, which includes work on three different versions of the Farm Bill. Part of his Farm Bill work includes supporting the Native Farm Bill Coalition, a new effort to give Native Americans a strong, united voice to advance a common Farm Bill agenda benefiting Indian country. Colby, thanks so much for joining us. I'm really happy we can hear from you today. Well, thank you so much for having me on the program, Kelly. I'm very excited to to talk with you all. So the website, Colby, of your program says it leads with, we promote tribal sovereignty through food and agriculture. Would you please explain the concept of tribal sovereignty and uh, the historical factors that have shaped it? Absolutely. Tribes are essentially governments and we're the very first governments located in in North America, Central America and and South America. And so um, when we talk about the idea of tribal sovereignty, it's truly that acknowledgement that tribal governments must have the ability to be able to set their own path, make decisions regarding their own tribal citizenry and how to best be able to serve them. And so when looking at how it was sort of shaped, when you look at some of the particular history of first colonizers coming over from Europe, interacting with tribal governments, there was sort of that initial recognition of, of being able to say that there, that there were people here, that there were governments here, and then how, how that interaction kind of played. And you can see that as entering into different agreements, entering into treaties, working with tribal governments and being able to say what are the different things that needs to be done to try to adjust the situation of colonists coming over. There was a lot of complex, very strong indigenous food systems that included farming, irrigation, subsistence, uh, hunting and gathering. And so there were a lot of different types of, of agriculture production and food production and food system and trade that was going on at the same time. And entering into some of the different treaties, there was that acknowledgement of tribes as governments, but the idea of being able to sort of sideline that and in introduction of European style models of agriculture and entering into agreements to have access to land and to some land of removal. And throughout time, as became more forced removal, military forced, forced agreements, forced treaties. Um, you start to be able to see the shift and change. And there was always a sort of interaction between the United States government and tribal governments in various different ways that recognition that tribes, tribes had some type of governmental status, had land rights as well, too. And it was really kind of the idea of saying, particularly for the people that were coming over to be able to say, well, what are the things that we need to be able to to establish ourselves? And so you see a lot of back and forth interaction. And so we have the federal government coming in, entering into agreements, not upholding those agreements, and then making other determinations. There was also this, I mean, saying we want to enter into an agreement and then kind of go our separate ways. Then there was the idea that the federal government wanted tribes to be able to, and Native people to assimilate into um, into European culture, into the United States. And then there was being able to say, well, maybe we should go back to where it was. So there was always a sort of back and forth, which has created a very complex structure of it. But what's the most underlying and important part of that is that um, tribes as sovereign entities need to be able to have the ability and authority and protections to set out what they want to be able to do to help protect their own citizens. Well, Colby, how can addressing food and agriculture help in this context? One of, one of my friends and, and someone that we've worked with for a long time, um, Ross Racine, who's been the executive director of Intertribal Agriculture Council for over 30 years, has, has always said that um, you're not really truly sovereign until you have the ability to be able to feed yourself. So by helping further and advance tribal sovereignty within the space of food and agriculture, really help be able to provide strong ways of self-determination and strong tribal self-governance to determine what are some of the best forms of methods. And I think that what you see a lot particularly is, is that 
tribal governments as the people who serve their citizens are in the best position to be able to make determinations about what is necessary to do so. And so that is being able to make uh, determinations regarding the types of food, traditional foods, being able to help uh, protect and support traditional and cultural practices within that as well, too, looking at ways to be able to help support um, appropriate development in areas that need to be able to have that and to be able to help provide jobs and a strong and vibrant tribal community. So what are some of the main things that you are working on to try to help accomplish this goal? So our initiative does a lot of work, um, tribal government sovereignty. And so looking at that, we work directly with tribes, tribal food producers, and tribal organizations to really help further this goal. And looking at trying to build strong, healthy food systems, uh, some of the different um, things that we do, produce safety training for native pro, uh, for native produce growers to understand some of the issues that come under compliance and look at it from the idea of what what does a tribe, what does a tribal producer need to know about that rule? What are some of the different concerns that come up, particularly looking at tribal government sovereignty? We also do a native youth and agriculture summit. We're entering our, our sixth year of that as well, too, to be able to take some of the of the youth that are in tribal communities to bring them uh, to Arkansas and you know, go through some additional educational opportunities, show them some of the different things that are going on, with, work on some projects, and then they take those um, that information back to their communities and continue to do some of the incredible work. We also try to be able to help uh, native food businesses and tribal food enterprises scale up and take that next step, food business, and looking at being able, how do we make this a, a strong economic and sustainable economic development opportunity to be able to employ people and to build out a strong food system. Um, and additionally, we also serve as the research partner in the Native Farm Bill Coalition, uh, which was started in October 2017 by the Shakopee, Metawakan, and Sioux community, uh, which is uh, located just outside of St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, in their Seeds of Native Health campaign, they were looking at ways to try to be able to address some systemic issues of food, food insecurity, health, access to healthy and traditional foods in tribal communities, and wanted to take a look at the Farm Bill at some of the different ways of making some federal policy changes, which would hopefully be able to help support tribal sovereignty. Colby, let's come back to the Farm Bill in just a moment. But before that, I'd like to ask a question that's rooted in history. So, Many Native American populations were moved involuntarily from some of the nation's most fertile lands to some of the nation's most infertile lands. Is there any way of correcting that, or how, how does that issue get addressed in the work that you and others do? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the issues that um, really came up when you're looking at forced removal and taking off of some of the different lands, you do see a movement of, of tribal governments trying to be able to purchase land back. But what I would say is probably one of the, the tougher issues that, that impacts not only food and agriculture, but also tribal government uh, sovereignty and the ability to be able to assert even regulatory jurisdiction to protect land and protect water um, is after the period in, in of a forest removal, there was a period of allotment where the tribal lands were, many tribes were relocated to were allotted or broken up into smaller segments that were taken out of sort of the trust status that the, the protected status and agreements that tribal governments uh, entered into with the federal government that allowed that land to have uh, some type of protection from al from alienation. And so when that land was opened up, you had a lot of either non-Indians coming in to settle that land, to farm it, to work it. You also had that land being given to folks in fee. And so sometimes that land was either sold or it was leased out to non-Indian farmers. And a lot of times when that happens, it's done on, on pennies on the dollar. Um, and so when that happens, typically when someone uh, doesn't quite own the land or have that sort of equity or status, it's not theirs. They're not going to take care of it. They're just going to focus on the production that they need to be able to, to have to sustain their business and to sustain um, uh, their production. And then they're going to move on. So when you have that type of large land loss, it can create an, an incredibly difficult situation just trying to be able to exercise authority over it and to have access to a lot of land. So some of the different things that we try to do um, to, to help support that is we're working with a few tribes. And there was an act that was passed in 1993, the American Indian Agriculture Resource Management Act. Um, and under that act, tribal governments can develop agriculture resource management plans, which look at all of the different land 
uh, some of the different things that um, all the different natural resources that are available, start making some different types of evaluations of production, conservation, protection, and other considerations, develop out what they want to be able to do over a 10-year or plus period, then work with the Department of the Interior, who is the trustee in that scenario, to get their approval for it. And then the tribe can then run and then manage the land underneath that plan on its own after that status. And that's a very strong way of being able to support tribal government sovereignty and really acknowledging the fact that tribal governments must be the ones that are making the decisions and terminations of their land. In Native American culture, I'm I'm aware that there has been a very special relationship between people and their land, care for the land and nurturing of the land, things like that. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Absolutely. In, in many in many Native American cultures and for many Native people, um, the, the land and the resources that are surrounding it are, are, are sacred and there's a very special tie to it. One of the things that you really see with this, and particularly when we're looking at you know supporting different changes in the Farm Bill, different ways of federal policy, supporting tribal government sovereignty, that understanding and that and, and just and just really that basis is so incredibly important because um tribal governments aren't going anywhere. They've been here since before pre contact. They'll be here regardless of, of anything that happens um in the future. And so um what you see is that sometimes where tribal governments are located, um even in sometimes very rural areas, sometimes they're the only government that exists. And that government's not going away. That town's not going to fold. It's not going to become a ghost town because that's where the tribe is. That's their land. So being able to help support tribal governments, tribal governments also serve all people within their service area as well, too. So with that understanding of being able to help further that, you can really do a lot to help revitalize a lot of rural areas that in many different parts of Indian country by helping further and support tribal government sovereignty because they'll be the ones that will be there on the land. Colby, how um, how does the Farm Bill figure in here? How is it relevant and what can be done in that context? The Farm Bill is critically important. What was pretty interesting is when you look at the very first Farm Bill, which I think was in 1933, and it came out around the, the Dust Bowl era, and it had the strong conservation focus. It also had a focus on homesteading um, because that was occurring right around that time. We had some of the very first homestead acts, you know, which was started around the started around the allotment period, and and you had um, more west westward momentum and trying to be able to support people who had moved and gone west for it. But there was nothing included within that very first farm bill that supported tribal agriculture. And so, what makes it really difficult is that you know agriculture has gone on and it's had this incredible support from USDA with with the USDA starting in 1862. And that's a very interesting point in time because when USDA came about, it also established the land grant system where you have a lot of universities that are setting up on places where tribal land was located, supporting food and agriculture, going and supporting the homesteaders that are going through. And then the recognition about 60 years later or 70 years later that there needed to be federal farm policy to protect the land. And then the land that was setting up this land grant and educational system hadn't ever addressed some of the issues and concerns with tribal agriculture or supported tribal agriculture. So up until about 1990, there were very, very few and maybe none mentions of tribes in Farm Bill authorities. Thanks to the work of uh, Ross Racine and the folks at Intertribal Agriculture Council, you see in, in, in the early 90s some additional mentions of tribes and tribal governments focused on conservation. So you basically cut from almost 150 years worth of a land grant system and about 70 years of a farm bill until and tribal governments and tribal producers start to be able to have that type of inclusion within the program. And there had been some additional work to be able to go, to go there. But why it's so important at the federal level is not only to address that large gap of, of over 150 years of not having particular focus supporting tribal tribal governments and native producers and agriculture, but but there's there's really also the the importance of the federal government relationship with tribes. It's tribal governments as sovereigns have a direct relationship with the federal government. So everything the federal government does policy-wise, land-wise, regardless of the agency, has a substantial impact in industry. So being able to address and make changes in the federal farm bill is incredibly important just because anytime there's a change in federal f- policy, particularly ones that focus on land, land and production and conservation, and looking at some of the rural authorities and as 
the farm bill, I think, is probably the second largest spending bill, non-defense spending bill that Congress passes, and one of the only truly rule-focused bill. All of those factors make it a piece of legislation um, which can have a substantial amount of, of, of an ability to be able to really help support tribal governments. Colby, what are some of the things that people can do who may want to help the tribes? The work and the, and, and the effort has to be tribally driven. If you have uh, tribal governments in your in your area community or, or working with them within your um, within your school as well, I, I think is really being able to reach out and, and kind of asking the question of, of how can I help or what are some of the different things that I can do to be able to help support what you what what you're looking to be able to do in this. So I think that's probably one of the best um, one of the best things that 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 folks can be able to do. Sometimes what you see is a lot of the history food and agriculture, that there's always been this top-down approach of trying to be able to impose European-centric ideas and westernized government ideas on top of tribes for that for food and agriculture production. But being able to change that around and going to a tribe and working with tribal producer, tribal businesses, being able to say, what what are you looking to do and how can I help? What are some of the things that, that I can do to be able to do that? And coming from, from that perspective. And if there was one thing you'd like people to take away from this conversation, what would it be? I think it would be, I think it would be the, just the strong uh, recognition of, of tribal governments as governments, as really the first sovereigns in this country, but also being able to look as tribal governments as, as partners and, and being able to develop out strong food systems and being, and helping support um, rural parts of this country. You know, there's a lot of opportunities to be able to work together and to build things out. And, and I think approaching it from a true strong tribal, tribal, tribal centric perspective of being able to, to, to work directly with tribes and help support their efforts in this are very important. So I, I think that would be probably the, the one thing. Well, Colby, thanks so much for joining us today and thank you for being a leading voice in food. I appreciate your time. Oh, no problem. Thank you very much for having me. Our guest today has been Colby Duran. Director of the Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative at the University of Arkansas Office of Economic Development. And thank you for listening. Please subscribe to the Leading Voices in Food at Google Play, Stitcher, Radio Public, or Apple Podcast, or you can visit the website of the Duke World Food Policy Center. This is Kelly Brownell. <music>